Hey everybody, welcome to Hit Rewind. This episode is a special holiday episode, mini-sode I guess if you want to say, with me and Andrew. Um, we normally do Disney movies. Technically, <clears throat> these are now Disney movies. And technically, no, but you can still catch them on, on you know, the streaming platform that is Disney. <laughs> It's, it's one of those, I should actually say what it is first, <laughs> uh, the Ewok adventure movies that were two years in a row after Star Wars, George Lucas saw the possibility of bringing Star Wars to television. Um, something he he's tried over and over, and live action he's never really been able to do. Animation he's been able to pull off. It wasn't until uh, Disney Plus is when like the live action shows really became a thing. Yeah, and I think really, you know, with, with the evolution of, um, and we've we've touched on this plenty of times, but back then, uh, you know, only nerds were into Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, you know, these these you know writers now, and and the way that people have had the story and have had the Star Wars universe in their hands, like they're they're, I guess you could say nerds as well, but they're established directors, writers, and, and you know have a certain pedigree to them. So storytelling is just. I mean, it is a lot better now uh, as far as everything that they're doing. But you know, back then, these these writers and, and a lot of like these movies were written by Jared Lucas himself. But it was just a little little bit different than that, as as, as acclaimed. Yeah, it's it's weird to think that by '86, Star Wars was dead in the water. It's only three years after Return of the Jedi. Th- to think of that now, how many years has it been since Rise of Skywalker? Four, and it's still going very strong. Yeah, just about, and then of course the, the shows and everything is kind of keeping everything alive. Yeah, I can tell you how many times I've in the last, uh, I'd say in the last like three or four years, I've showed my, my younger brother the whole trilogy. I've sold my son the whole trilogy all the way through. So yeah, it kind of has this life every so often when a few years go by, and I'm, I'm watching the trilogy all over again. Well, it's it's so strange that a franchise with such a rich world of different species, different planets, various stories going on at the same time. And then they were kind of like, no, we're good with just three movies. Like, that that idea now does not exist. They explore every single nook and cranny of something that rich. Yeah, and, and the, the great thing, you know, when, when we start looking at some of the more popular things today, like The Mandalorian or even the uh, Ahsoka, like the, the very, very more recent shows, these are all somewhat side characters or you know the first time you see the Mandalorian is Boba Fett and he's in a movie like very little and barely talks and now they're the whole race of them you know so they can really expand on that you know everything that was canon before with comics they can expand on a whole universe of that yeah it was a really niche thing for years uh, to explore those. I mean, they had the Marvel comic book series, and that died in 87. They had the droids and the Ewoks cartoon. That did a little bit of it, but for the most part, we had to wait till the 90s with, like, Shadows of the Empire, and, uh, like, there were, like, these one-off miniseries, like the Bounty Hunter stories, you know, where they were in competition with each other, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But the, um... Return of the Jedi is much loved, and I still think it's a pretty good movie, even though sometimes as an adult I wonder why George Lucas kind of... I think he got scared by Empire Strikes Back being too dark and not being as successful and kind of pulled back and made it more kid-friendly, and it seemed like it was really downhill from there. It's just more and more kid-friendly as the years would go on until there was like, oh, it disappeared for a while, and then slowly started to build back up with teenagers and adults. Yeah, the the funny thing is, uh, I'm a huge like How I Met Your Mother fan, but there's the, a huge theory of, um, you know, obviously with Return, you introduce Ewoks, you introduce you know, this whole new species of animal, and really at that time, you know, as they allude to on the on the TV show the sitcom, you know, the younger kids love that movie because they see Ewoks, they're cuddly, cute teddy bears, so yeah. You know, a certain age group is obviously um, targeted because of that, and of course, marketability and everything. Uh, but then you have the hardcore fans that didn't really take well to Ewoks. Yeah, <laughs> so you're, you're, you're two types of uh, original trilogy fan. You're either an Ewok lover or an Ewok like not necessarily a hater, but like you don't you don't really like them that much. 
I'm fine with them. It's I was that right age. I was like seven or eight when the Ewoks really were. I didn't, I didn't get to see Return of the Jedi in the theaters. I was watching these. I had both the Ewok movies taped, and I was watching the cartoons, so I was completely fine with it. Um, but I can see maybe if you were like college age or something like that, and you're like, oh my god, Empire Strikes Back. It's so moody and dark and complicated and whatever, and you're like, what is this? There's there's a balance of both, honestly, in Return of the Jedi. I wish people would acknowledge that it's for everybody. Yeah, and, and it's it's the you know, and, and it's hard because a lot of times with these stories, in this type of story or this universe, in, in that sense, back then, this, this was the end. This is the last movie, so you have to you have to end it on somewhat of a higher note, or you know, kind of like the happy happy ever happily ever after ending, in order to kind of satisfy. A lot of the fans or a lot of this story because back then I mean I, I, I'm sure George Lucas wasn't anticipating no we're going to make six more movies and TV shows and all this other stuff so yeah I don't I'm not like a hardcore Star Wars fan but I, I you know there was periods where I was really into it I remember like originally he only wrote outlines for what happened before uh, Star Wars and that was it he just wanted a world that was already built like you were coming in just like the old serials that you know you're coming into the middle of the adventure and didn't really have any idea of what he would do for a six, seven, and nine. Maybe he had an outline or whatever. But then later he would just, he was thinking about it more and more, or whatever. And then slowly expanded upon it. I don't think he ever intended on actually doing nine films. Yeah, and and even even when you came out with a second trilogy, it's it's makes sense. It's a prequel. It really okay. You know, kind of how the story of Darth Vader, how he became Darth Vader, and everything like that, which is great. To see, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Vader fan and Anakin fan myself. Uh, you know, one of my favorite characters in, in the whole universe is, is Anakin. Um, so that makes sense. And then, of course, they come out with the more recent trilogy where it's everything that happens after, which is now opens everything up to a whole new world of, you know, what the possibilities are, what direction you want to go in, and, and a whole new set of characters that we haven't seen before. Yeah. The, um, I wonder if there's a whole generation that feels the same way about Jar Jar, the way that we did Ewoks. We're like, for them, they're like, well, I love Jar Jar. I saw it when I was like eight years old. It's great. I'm fine with it or whatever. And we're like, what? But that's probably the same thing with the Ewoks back then. Yeah, yeah, it's for sure. It's like the, the whole different type of effect of like, what the heck is this character doing? Is this horrible character? And, you know, I, I mean great thing about uh you know jar jar is it's, it's kind of funny well maybe not great thing but people have their theories about him being like the sith lord and everything <laughs> so, <laughs> okay that's weird <laughs> it's pretty pretty outlandish and weird but it, it's just you know one of those universes where in any 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 kind of alien or any, everything's up to the imagination like yeah. obviously in a universe are, are most likely aliens or, or species that you know nobody has seen before uh and they, they're going to be prominent possibly very soon or in future projects that I have. So so this brings us back to uh, the first real spinoff from the whole thing. Yes, there's the holiday special, which of course is notoriously like a head scratching weird. There's little bits and pieces that are really cool, but for the most part, you can just see like George Lucas is like, okay, this just helps promote the movie. Sure, why not? But then like, Ugh, pulls back. Whereas... The Ewoks apparently originally was pitched as another holiday special, and he didn't want to do that again. So, you know, it's like five years later, and he realized what a mistake it was. But then he's like, what about we just do, like, a full movie expanding upon what we um, have built, whatever, and utilizing the special effects team that we have, you know, keep them employed, keep them going, but not being too expensive. I bet you this was really expensive, though, for 1984 on television. This looks like a $10 million movie. Yeah, and, and a lot of the special effects obviously you set back into the Star Wars world, you know, off off world type of thing, futuristic spaceships, uh, things like that, and then even you know they delve a little bit into the claymation uh, with with some of the uh, monsters in the first movie. So, I mean, I, I would imagine it would it was a significant budget in order to get those looking to how people have come to expect at that point, like what Star Wars is supposed to look like and feel like. Yeah, well, apparently they tried some new way of filming the stop motion um, so that it wasn't so jittery. And I do notice there is, like, a difference between this and, say, stop motion from Clash of the Titans, which was four or three years earlier, where it really seems like not only is it really jittery, but 
there is a clear separation in the camera where you can see like, oh, the grainy part with the actor, you know, and then the smooth part with the stop motion. Whereas I think they found a way of just like, it's almost like plates. Do you know what I mean? Like when you do a matte shot or a plate shot where you have one thing and you can have the other one right next to it, as long as you don't cross that line, it's still believable. Yeah, yeah, and, and well, even just the opening scene uh, of, this, of the first movie, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not even any type of claymation or anything. It's just a forced perspective type of shot where, I mean, obviously they probably shot everything separately, but you, you have this monster running through the forest, and you know, it, obviously you can tell it's somebody in a suit. Uh, and then, of course, later on, they, they, they delve over to the, or they switch over to, like, the claymation for the second monster. So it's 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 definitely, you know, they, they're messing around with it, playing with it, trying to refine it. Uh, and you see it two different ways here in this movie. It's funny is I was just watching Batman versus Superman and I kept thinking that Doomsday could have been forced perspective guy in a really good suit. And sometimes the old effects still work really well. Yeah, and, and that's like, I mean, obviously we talked about a huge uh, cartoon following the Ninja Turtles. Like, I seriously think that the first movies when you know it's actors in suits has been one of the best movies as far as the effects and everything like that not not cgi nothing nothing that's too cartoony or that looks fake you know those those old suits they you know with the moving mouse mouths and the and the eyes and everything it, it just it comes off so much better than some of the other stuff they do i mean everything now obviously is cgi to you know, yeah. make things easier, but well, there, there it's always a, great to see those things. Yeah, it's a real magic because this is the point where Lucas is working so closely with Henson, and you know they're doing Labyrinth and uh, the Return to Oz. They're 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 like a special effects puppetry team, and I don't know who designed the Ewok uh, makeup, but it, if you told me it was the Jim Henson team, I would go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and that's the great thing about these movies is it, it, it is the exact same in the movie. If you watch Return of the Jedi, or Return of the Jedi, you, you see it's the same costume, it's the same you know actors, it's the same everything. Yeah. But it's really, you know, really great because sometimes maybe they do try to save a little money by doing something different. Obviously, there are different Ewoks that weren't in the movie, but you, you, know, you introduce a couple different characters, but... You know, for the most part, you you're seeing it, there's a consistency there, and, yeah. it, and it looks good, and it feels again, it feels like a Star Wars movie because of the recognition of the Ewoks. Yeah, it's. I think over the course of the films too, that the actors inside the Ewok costumes really understood how to utilize the movements to make it believable and be emotive. It's kind of like the way the old Planet of the Apes movies were, where they gave Roddy McDowell like five movies to really learn how to use that makeup and come off convincing even though we know it's a rubber mask but he was able to use it right yeah exactly um the only thing i don't like about this movie and yes it is clearly all maybe even g-rated um i won't say that the second movie is a lot darker but i like the little girl i do not like the luke skywalker uh wannabe uh, he's so everything he says he has a face like he just smelled a really bad fart every time he goes to say something. <laughs> you got that old Joey uh, smell the fart uh, method acting. Yeah, it's it was exhausting. After a while, I was like, dude, could you just say something like a normal human being? <laughs> yeah, and and I will say that that was a little bit of a, of a pain point because his character it, it's it's very at times confusing because he's you know at first very obviously just like defensive of his sister and. Being safe and trying to to protect his sister, and obviously he walks capture them and, and whatnot. And then you know she's sick. Oh, please help her! Somebody help her! Help her! Like, what are you guys doing? Just help her! And then you know she they help her. She's better. Okay, now we gotta we can't trust these guys at all. Like, <laughs> yeah, the inconsistency. Like, like, like you were you were just asking for their help, and now you can't trust them. Like, uh, you know, make up your mind on what you want. You know, what, what you kind of want. <laughs> Yeah, it's this one is more of just a, a road trip kind of journey to go find their parents. It or it's kind of like the, their version of going to Mordor. The Ewoks are very close in, uh, I guess, like the way they they set up their story is kind of like the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. Well, the the biggest thing that I was like the first thing I noticed that kind of hurt me a little bit was 
the narration. And it's like, uh, we're, we're going to have, you know, a movie where it's mostly just narration, like what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so it's different because you don't, you don't see narration or hear narration from, from any point, uh, when it comes to Star Wars, there's no narration. It's all just subtitles. Yeah, it's, it's funny because it almost it almost is like a, a nature show setting where it's like right, it's like yes, a, or like a, a fairy tale. It feels like an old like Heidi kind of thing, or um, uh, you know, a grim a grim story tale. It, it, it well, having Burl Ives be the narrator, I think, also is because the two humans in this aren't very good actors, and you have a bunch of Ewoks who only say things like Nurdle and Space Cruiser. Yeah. <laughs> Broken gibberish. The uh, yeah, Burl Ives, I believe, is the narrator of. It's either uh, Rudolph or it's Frosty the Snowman. I can't remember which one. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I mean, both are classics. So, yeah. yeah. The um, is there any other, anything you want to say about the first one before we move on to the second? Uh, no, I mean, it, it, story wise, I mean, you kind of see everything. You get you get the Star Wars feel. Like it dragged on a little bit. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's, you kind of have to take it at face value. It's, it's definitely something to kind of keep you into the universe or you know, trying to keep you, uh, I guess, invested in, in these Ewoks and these characters. Yeah. The, uh, so the first one I only watched maybe three or four times, and I kind of just erased it with something else. I have seen <laughs> the second one maybe 30 times. I watched this thing over and over as a, a child. And it is a better movie, and a lot of it is because it, I think they really pinned down on how to do the special effects on television. They got rid of the characters that weren't working, and they got a, a, a better writers. The guys who wrote and directed this, they did Pitch Black and a couple of the Nightmare on Elm Streets, and I think one of the Fly movies. So you can see like they're putting more money into someone with like I don't know, like a more of a voice. Like they, they're bringing, and it's more sophisticated. It feels like it's borderline PG thirteen. There, it's wholesale slaughter for a kids movie. Yeah, and that, that's the, the funny thing about it. Like, you know, the, these characters that you you have watched in the first one that have been prominent in the first one. I mean, sorry, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it by now, but uh, they're gone. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> fast. <laughs> Yeah, it's they introduce a whole other species of uh, uh, creatures that weren't part of the Star Wars world, which is interesting because why did we think that Endor was only Ewoks? I, we had no idea how big that planet was. Wait, wait, it's not Endor, right? It's the third moon of Endor or something like that? Yeah, it's like a moon, a distant moon okay. But it is interesting, like, they oh, hey, we have these people here. Uh, I can't remember, though. Um, they crash there, right? They're not, they're not technically from that planet, and they want the power source to get off the planet? Yeah, so... I believe, you know, in the first movie they crashed onto that planet. That's, that's, they were uh, separated. And then the second movie is I'm trying to get off the planet by doing the repairs for the ship. Uh, so the family still wants to be able to go back, quote unquote, home uh, and leave it or, or the moon in order to get, get home. So they, that's a, the biggest thing with the second one is those repairs are almost finished uh, and then everything happens. Yeah. It's, it's funny how many people crash there, because <laughs> it seems like 90% of the people don't belong there. <laughs> the, uh, but I think they really introduced like, a couple really good villains. Because in the first one, the only villain is someone who really doesn't talk, and you know, they're using forced perspective. And so now they have like this army, um, and a really cruel uh, warrior king, and um, uh, like a medi- uh, the, what I say, like a witch or a magician? Yeah, it's a witch. Yeah, and so they have a lot more to work with. And they don't, they don't have the narrator in the second movie, but they have uh, Wilford Brimley come in, and he's kind of that voice. Yeah, and, and that's the, 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 the lot more meat on this bone, uh, if you can say, when it comes to you know somewhat of a battle and struggle uh, before it's like, oh, parents are lost, and the monster took them uh, with... with not much motivation or anything like that. Now, obviously, you have a whole army that have a goal of, of obtaining this power crystal or this power source that these, this family is using to get off of the, the planet. <clears throat> and now, you know, they've got and stolen this power source and they're using it for what they want to use it for, you know, evil and, and destruction. So 
it's definitely more along the lines of a credible like oh, okay like this is this is the kind of story that we're used to uh, you know, rather than just a kind of one-off yeah it's it got a little tired. I'm glad they, they finally slowed down on it. But with Wilford Brimley being so insanely mean to a human child, he hasn't seen one in who knows how many decades. You think that he'd be immediately like, holy crap, it's great! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, then the, the great thing is they kept the same actress uh, who played you know, the little little girl. Uh, I forget her name. Uh, Sindel. But you know, have that consistency, yeah. Yeah, the consistency in that sense. Yeah, and I love the new characters they add. I love the little speedy guy, Teak. Uh, when I was a kid, he just cracked me up to no end. <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, Michael, if you only saw this, I remember seeing the second one. At, at no point at all when you were younger did you say, think like, oh, what happened or why this? Why is this family here or anything like that? Um, well, so the first movie was taped off of television, but we missed the first 20 minutes. We were out shopping for Christmas, and we forgot that it was going to be on TV, so I never got to see the beginning. So I assumed they had crashed there. But earlier when I was asking about that, I was wondering where the bad guys came from. Or were they always on that planet, or did they also crash there? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good point. You don't really get that <laughs> at all. Um which makes you think, like, oh, or, you know, there weren't any rumblings in the first one or anything like that. Uh, or in Return of the Jedi, you think they would have teamed up with the Empire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and, and obviously we know in a lot of the story adaptations nowadays, you know, they're, it's not so much of a, like, oh, one side, one side. There's also, you know, a gray area, I guess you could say, with some people just kind of out for their own. So that's true. Job the Hutt but, established that. <laughs> Exactly, and you see you see some some of that like on Book of Boba Fett, or even you know like the Mandalorians are like kind of on their own um, with the with the newer episodes. Um, so it's not it's not so just bad guy good guy. There's obviously a lot of gray areas. So it's, it's a possibility they are too, but again, like because the universe is where it's at now, it, it's 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 hard to go back and be like, oh, well, what are, like what can we do here uh, as far as when they're writing everything in the moment. Yeah, you know what's funny is I just realized it was the first thing we ever taped. We had we had got the VCR on that trip. This is literally the first thing we ever taped on a VHS. <laughs> oh, nice. Did it ever uh, fast forward to the commercials? No, I. Here's the weird thing is I loved commercials back then, and sometimes uh-huh. this is weird. But when I was working retail and I would come home for lunch, I didn't have time enough really to watch anything except. <laughs> old clips of commercials or whatever on YouTube like someone put together like a half hour of commercials from the 80s and I would just watch those <laughs> I don't know why I just like them <laughs> well it, it, it jogs a memory it's always that, that nostalgia type of thing of, of a kid wanting whatever it is that's advertised to so yeah there was there was a couple of cartoons that were debuted after this it was kind of like, hey, tomorrow, Saturday morning, is the debut of our new lineup. And they had Foofer. No one remembers Foofer. And then some, <laughs> And then there was one about a, a bear in, like, the bayou. And I don't remember what that was called or whatever. But I remember watching those a bunch, too. Yeah, a little, a little before my time. But, I mean, I, I think my, my earliest memory of, of any kind of cartoon uh, you know, or, or anything like that is probably like X Men, Swamp Thing, and those, those yeah. types of items. Yeah, and, and our listeners should know there's a, I think at least a decade between us. I'm set. I was born in '77. You were what? '88. '87. '87. Okay. Yeah. So my world is different than yours. You weren't even born when this came out. Holy crap! I feel so old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, went back and watched. The, uh, well, first time watching a lot of it. I knew that, that they were there. Like I said. Um, but obviously, these these movies happened before I was even born, before I was even introduced to the Star Wars universe. Uh, but it's a great it's a great expansion. I mean, there there isn't anything out there that focuses on the Ewoks as much as these movies do. Yeah. So it's always great to see and kind of revisit that, or, or see that this these uh, the species has a life outside of what they did, which was you know help the rebels uh, defeat the Empire. Yeah, and I thought I thought the final battle was really uh, good. It, it's something like the, someone really focused on. Okay, well, this is a kids' movie, but let's let's bring some of that Return of the Jedi, you know that that battle they had on the planet, that energy to this movie. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's uh, of course, you know, at this point, probably we are understanding like this is going to be the last the last one, so we got to have the the cookie cutter ending in a sense where the good guys prevail. Yeah, and. Uh, and 
it did continue after this, but they ditched the whole, you know, human part when they did the animated series. So it's the two movies, yeah. 84, 85, and I believe by the time this aired, they were ready to go with the cartoon. So it was always like, I think at 11 o'clock, God, why do I remember this shit? I can't remember the name of my own family members. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, it was always uh, Ewoks first and then Droids. And both of them really expanded upon the universe. And there was even comic books of this, like their own, not Star Wars, Ewoks and droids had their own comic book lines. Yeah, yeah, and I I haven't looked or, or seen if, if it's part of the quote unquote canon because obviously there's just so many things out there uh, when it comes to the Star Wars universe that officially Disney's not recognizing as canon or anything like that. Yeah, but, well, um, they they did. It, it's funny as they were embarrassed by these movies. They ditched these for the longest time. They were on DVD for a very short period of time after Phantom Menace came out. And then they're like, oh, you know what? No, 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 no. Let's just throw these away. So if you have the DVDs of this, they're probably worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. I think they had the same effect as, as when you watch it again. <laughs> you watch the first one and you text me like, I'm so sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then I watched the second one. I was like, okay, it's not that bad. But the first one, I was struggling. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a struggle. I had to, I had to rewind it a few times. So like, I just I cannot stay interested in this. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of it's the pacing on the first one. It's so slow. And that kid is so yeah. irritating. And I think yeah. they learned from that with the second movie. Yeah, and it, and it's great because obviously the 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 conception out there is the sequel is never you know, as good as the first one. And in yeah. this instance, that's, that's not the case. It, it, the storytelling is better. The overall arc is better. The graphics, uh, you know, special effects are better. It, it is a better movie than the first one in this. Well, yeah, and what they have to go through that journey, they both grow up. They're forced to grow. Wicked jumps light years. He's like a baby in the first movie, and then he feels like he's in charge, for, you know, to protect Sindel in the second movie. And I think the the um, the risks that they go through are higher too. Yeah, and of course it's 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 one of the last times you see in the universe anyway for now like in, in Wicked or you see any of the Ewoks in there um, but it, it, it'd be very interesting to see obviously with, with everything they're doing nowadays if they plan to revisit or decide to revisit that species or Wicked and everything yeah, obviously or, actors are a lot older, but. you know Sindel she would be like my age you know now yeah. she could be pilot or whatever and she goes to visit the Ewoks like a reunion just have it as an off thing in, in like a, a mini series like a four episode kind of like return to the moon of Endor or something you know yeah and that's a, I mean that's a great thing about the Star Wars universe and what it, where it's at today because those possibilities are there the possibilities are really kind of endless when it comes to everything I mean I, I can tell you I've, I've, I've watched <clears throat> uh, the Clone Wars the cartoon animated series I've watched that whole thing through I watched a good amount of Rebels, but I, I, you know, can sit there, you know, two or three years ago and tell you, like, I don't think they'll ever make a live action, like, you know, Ahsoka character. I don't think yeah. they'll make a live action Rebel, you know, all these Rebels characters they start seeing. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how excited, uh, even though they did, them, they did them dirty, you can tell you how excited I was to see Cat Bane, like, show up, like, uh, live action. Like, oh, man, this is awesome. Like, this is, this is when, like, you know, things are going to get real now. Um, so it's it's really nice to see that, especially being a fan of these animated series or these these um, series that were on TV for so long, you know, a few you know, few years ago. And now you're seeing the live action adaptations of that's great. It's it's good to see. Now, have you ever seen the actual planet Endor in anything, or is that still a mystery? Um, I I have not. Uh, usually, uh, I mean the the, the whole Clone Wars. Um, series was all still that's that prior to order 66 going on so it happens in between um the movies attack of the clones and uh revenge of the sith oh, okay i was just curious because i wonder when he leaves the planet does he go to endor like that ship didn't i mean it's running but i can't imagine after decades of sitting there that it's working that well he probably had to get <laughs> another ship or some repairs yeah yeah it, no idea but um, I, I haven't seen it in, in any other um, there's obviously video games where they explore worlds that are similar to it or you know other other worlds that are uh, like I, I played some of the Jedi Survivor and, and um, the 
Atlas Hutsu game that just came out, which it, it's it's a cool expansion. You see other worlds, other planets that you've never seen in any movies, and the habitats and different animals and things. But yeah, as far as Andorra, I've not seen anything. Uh, okay, I've not seen it uh, anything else. But, yeah. All right, everybody, that is the end of this episode. Uh, we'll be off until the spring. We'll be back with 1997, kids. Bam! Have a happy holidays, everyone. All right, thank you. Have a good one.